Um, Carrie Aaron, I think you've got one of the best jobs in Hollywood because you get to revisit this classic creepy story and you get to update it. We see uh, these characters with smartphones and smoking recreational pot. <laughs> just, just tell us about how you tackle this whole thing. Uh, I Well, first of all, I agree. I, I feel incredibly lucky to be able to work on this project. And, um, you know, Carlton and I just have always attacked it as as if it were a real story, as if, they, if, if you know, that these crazy people were living in a contemporary world, that they had this baggage with them. Um, and we really set out to tell a story that was suspenseful and a little pulpy. Um, but also had really, really grounded, nuanced character stories in it um, that will pull at your heart. Alfred Hitchcock once said that the formula for a great horror story is always tell the give the audience one bit of knowledge that your characters don't have. In other words, something that would make us scream, "Don't go in the attic!" You know, <laughs> don't. that's true. Yeah, so if you think about it. That your whole premise, your whole setup of Bates Motel, you know, in a way, is the perfect wrapping of that because we know what what's going to happen to Mama. She's going to end yeah. up in that chair, <laughs> stuffed in the upper window up there. We know where this is all going, yeah. but yet the characters don't. So, uh, it's it's just fascinating. It definitely shines a light on every single thing that happens. Uh, it puts a it puts a spotlight of of meaning on everything. I mean, as it would with anyone, if you knew somebody was going to s cease to live at a certain time or date, it would it would suddenly like driving in traffic on the freeway would be the most meaningful thing in the world. You know, it's and and I think that that's one of the really cool things about about the show and about people knowing where it's going. Um, and I think there is, I think there is actually like sort of a life affirming aspect to it because of that, which you would not have expected from doing a show about Bates Motel, about Psycho, you know, um, that there is, there is, uh, that it is real life, you know, it's, it's a real relationship between a mother and a son and everything that they go to and go through and all the ways that we have worked to we all hope they will get out of it. We all hope they, I hope they will get out of it. <laughs> you know, I know in part of my brain that's not gonna happen, but my heart hopes they will get out of it. Um, and I think, you know, I think we all feel that way. And I think that's one of the reasons the show is so rich. And it's rich in terms of the writing, this kind of foretelling and this wink at the audience that you're talking about. There's the scene, for example, in one of the final few episodes where uh, Norma and uh, Alex, the sheriff, are standing out in front of the of the hotel, and she's she's saying about oh how my poor uh, Norman, you know, he's the most precious child in the world, and then she just suddenly stops and she surrenders and she says, well, you know what? Maybe we should just surrender all of us to the, our fate. We're doomed, aren't we? And Alex says, yeah. <laughs> it was just this wonderful little zingy moment, or, or uh, another similar scene of uh, just this kind of acknowledging where this train is going is when, um, and you do this often as a writer, which I love, uh, is Norma is in the basement with uh, Norman. She's telling him, you know, all hell's breaking loose. Uh, they know that you killed your father. And he's yelling at her and he says, why do you do this, mom? And she says, not easy to be your mother. And she says, you're killing me, Norman, you're killing me. And you. <laughs> And you can have her say it a few times just in case we didn't get it the first time. <laughs> well, the funny thing about that, too, um, is that I, I've made jokes about that. that that's, that's something I, I say to my kids like three times a week. That, it, that, it is, that it's a weirdly relatable parent moment, you know, because you just get so frustrated that you're trying to do the right thing for them and they're not seeing it and you're not getting it. But, but again, in her case, with the spotlight of their future on it, it just gives it a whole other dimension. Um, but I think I think one of the things, one of the many, many multitude of things that's so amazing about Vera in this role is that uh, she captures a real human being and a real and a real mother and a person who's worried about her kid and does these crazy emotional 
scenes, you know, that that just go, you know, up, uphill and down dale, and 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 just is so grounded and so believable. Um, and it's it's honestly, it's like such a gift to a writer, you know. Um, when we first realized what she was doing in this role, you know, I mean. Carl and I were just, it's very exciting, you know, because then your brain starts going, okay, well, let's give her this, let's do this, let's make this crazy scene where she has to go from laughing to crying to falling down to, like, kicking something, you know, it's like, and she just, she just always makes it all real, and it's, it's truly amazing to watch, it's, it's really, it's been an education, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Because a lot of actresses can't do that, she's got this raw, uh, you know, fragility to it at all times that she could go in any emotion and we accept that watching her because yes. she pulls it off so well. I think yeah. if we ran a poll, viewers that is of the show, of what was your favorite moment, of everybody's favorite moment from this season, I think there would be only one winner, landslide by far, and it's when Dylan goes in the kitchen and Norman is in mama's dress <laughs> cooking breakfast. And I think the reason is, is, it was so shocking, at, and you had to play that card as a storyteller at some moment. We know that later on he's gonna speak in her voice and all of that's gonna happen, but you you so artfully dropped it in there and shocked the hell out of everybody, but made it so hilariously funny at the same time. That was brilliant, by the way. Thank you. Um, that whole episode was such a, such a cool experience because it really, um, it really grew out of itself, I mean, all we had going into that was this concept that we just instinctually felt if if the boys confronted her with talking to her brother that she would be like i'm i'm out of here like i'm leaving and she would just pack a bag and throw it in the car have no idea where she was going or what she was trying to prove and the idea of like following her on that night and getting to see some of who she was before she kind of invented Norma Bates, you know, before she decided, okay, we're going to start over. We're going to have a really nice, normal, beautiful life uh, in White Pine Bay, and we're going to run a motel, and it's all going to be beautiful. Um, and she kind of invented herself to do that. And, and it's part of, like, the clothing. It's part of um, the way she decorates the house. It's part of it's, it's just her whole persona. And, and this was really the idea of who was she without that. Who was she? What was left of her? What was down there? Uh, it was just such a. It was. It was exciting, but it was also really fun to write. And then also the. Um, it just. It dovetailed perfectly with Norman. Descending, you know, because she had left, and we could see what that, how that affected him, um, and it was. Yeah, I mean, it was. It was. It was. It was really powerful to to put that scene in finally you know yeah I, I think um it's clear now at the end of the season three that norman um and i'm not sure it's 100 percent clear stop me if i'm wrong here that norman is aware of his dark side that, that he's having more than blackouts that something really bad could be happening but but does he ever really kn know that what's unclear and kind of fun unclear is uh, Norma knows something's going on, and she's trying yeah. even to cover up it sometimes, and and it's yeah. it's scaring Dylan too. There's yeah. they all see you know flickers of this, but does Norman know? No, he senses. He definitely senses. He has feelings that there. Are, he has dark impulses, but he's not conscious completely of of what of certainly like of what happened with Bradley, you know. Um, and I think because the disorder he has is so, there's so many different versions of it, you know, I mean, anything that has to do with the brain is, is there's no linear way that it plays out, um, which is actually helpful and effective for storytelling, um, because it, it is, it is, it's a maze to him that he's trying to find his way through. Um, and I think that, you know, I think getting people to go on the ride with Norman is is the goal and the challenge of the show. Well, the the ride really goes you know off the track in a in a <laughs> way in that in that scene where he kills Bradley, uh, and that is um, uh, be, all of a sudden you have him impersonating his mother, but then you actually 
put Veer right there, uh, visually yeah. in the scene sometimes, and you switch in and out, and then um, we actually see a really gruesome murder take place. This isn't this isn't just a hint at that. He's bashing that girl's yes. head against the rock. You see yeah. the monster inside of this get this yes. guy really come out. And I think it was smart to do that because we have to we can't just be politely hitchcockian about this. We have to see, you know, yeah. according to today's modern standards of storytelling, we have to see all of that. Um, but but let's talk about that scene because the scene was just so wonderful because then it ends where Norma's gone and we see just the back of, of Freddie. And um, it, it kind of brings in all of the, the bizarre, the murder, the, psych, the psychology, the split personality, the weirdness, the, 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 the psychoness of this whole story into one really fun scene in terms of just, just the elements. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it was, we talked about that scene a lot um, about whether or not we should see Norman doing the murder or if it should be Vera. Uh, and it's a huge choice when you think about it. I know. Um, but I but I think because our our goal is to get people to be on the ride with Norman, that seeing it through his eyes was important. Seeing seeing what he believed was happening was important. And I also think you just you can't beat Vera chasing a girl. I mean <laughs> like, you know, I mean that that was just like an amazing scene, you know, her pulling Bradley out of the car and you know, chasing her around the tree and like grabbing her head. I mean, it's horribly violent. Um, and and the way Tucker uh, Gates shot it, um, and John Bartley, our DP, it, it's it's also stunningly beautiful. Um, it, it's it has like a real gothic quality to it. Um, and I love that little beat where you're on the camera where Norman gets out of the car and then it turns into Vera going around. Um, so there was just so there was so much collaboration and fun um, in in that sequence and writing it and and uh, producing it, um, but and and it's just scary as hell. Yes, it is. It's terrifying. <laughs> no, it's terrifying, and I and and my heart breaks for Bradley too. You know, it's 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 tough to watch. Now, but last I'll time I saw you, we were debating whether. Uh, Assuming uh, Vera gets nominated for an Emmy, she should submit episode six and or eight or ten. We ran yes. a poll. I don't know if you saw the results. Seventy-four percent said it's got to be episode six. Okay, I did. I did read that piece, and it was it was really wonderful. And um, thank you for your support. Oh, um, sure. well, I was impressed that you took your job seriously. Is is um, um, uh, making sure she had the right vehicle. As storytellers, in case she gets back in, and 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 as I that piece mentions, and as I've discussed with you and Carlton both, is that is um, the um, you often go in and out of the Emmys. It's not consecutive. It's like mm -hmm. Juliana Margulies won last year after she wasn't even nominated the year before. It happens, and uh, Vera has given such an outstanding uh, performance this year. She's got a lot of competition, but she'll have a real chance potentially to win um, if she gets in. So. It, it, it was cool that you actually, you know, gave her all all the tools she needed in one episode. Well, it was. It, I mean, it's a very interesting idea, um, and and I certainly never thought of it um, like that before. Uh, and then also, the, it, it it worked out so well in the storytelling within this episode. Do sort of a standalone right there that could, that could digress and take her through um, through so many different permutations mm -hmm. uh, and just like see what she can do because it's pretty dizzying. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, you know, to set her loose. <laughs> well, so, and you see her tearing through town, through the shops, going to the, the bars, picking up yahoos and crazy yeah. stuff. Wow. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was, and also that episode, I, it was, uh, I, I don't even think there was an outline for that one. I think we broke it on the room uh, and I, I think that I wrote it in like three days. It was sort of a, um, I, I kind of wrote it in a fever. <laughs> it was, like, uh, it, was, it, was, it kind of consumed me. Speaking of your writing process, uh, when we chatted last, you mentioned something really interesting, which is that, for example, let's take Dylan, the brother, yeah. Um, and you were saying that you know he's cast initially as this bad seed, a brother that comes into the family and is menacing and all of these things. But but um, 
you found a different way for him through the show that using you know, the qualities of the actor that you saw in him, this kind of vulnerability and, and sensitivity, et cetera, that you played off of that and that you didn't let it be a stereotypical character, that that uh, you gave him this ache to belong to the family, that he, uh, I mean, just talk about that, but how the, the, oh. the writing process, you discover new things while you do it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Dylan started out as a as an as an antagonist. He started out as somebody who could be an outside window on this weird relationship of Norman and Norman, and also someone who could be bad in a way that we would feel for Norma and Norman, um, rather than be afraid of them. And then, of course, we we cast the person with like the dearest face in the world to play this part, <laughs> um, Max Terrio. And um, he just brought something to it and it was hard. It was that longing. It was, you know, the way he looks at those photographs in that early episode when it, well, all the photographs of like Norma and, and his brother and none of him and his face is just so moving. And so we started to build that part of the character more um and i think that that happens a lot in television because you live with the actors you know that that you do end up kind of collaborating with their essence uh for lack of a better word it becomes just this organic life um that starts coming out of the combination of the actor and the writing and the pov of the of what you're writing you know um of the creators but yeah, I mean, his character is, has been such an interesting journey and, and so rewarding, you know, because he's so beloved. He, that, that character, I mean, like that kiss with Emma, people just went nuts. And I think because it's so, it was just so lovely and, and hopeful, you know, and they both deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, especially poor Emma. I mean, she's she's been uh, you know a a aching herself for love, and and uh, yeah. Norman exactly hasn't been uh, a very dutiful boyfriend. <laughs> no, he hasn't. He hasn't. He just, he was just trying. He was he wanted a he wanted to try to be normal. <laughs> it didn't work out. <laughs> You have two more seasons of the show. They gave you a five-year deal here, so uh, you've got a lot more time to play. Uh, do you do it to, to to plan it all? Do you do an outline? Um, is that how you work or do you, or do you just wing it episode to episode? What's your process? You know, I, I mean, let me, let me follow this. When Charles Dickens started writing, all of his books up to Oliver Twist uh, had no plot, no, no um, outline of the rest of it. He was just a storyteller having fun telling his story. And then he realized this is out of control. This is sprawling all over the place. So every book that, that Dickens wrote after that was, was from an outline. <laughs> how oh, do you do it? Funny. That's so funny, um, and he was so good at it too. At just at like cliffhangers and um, you know making people want to know is it going to be in the next installment. Um, we we have tent poles in general, um, both I would say like events tent poles and also emotional tent poles of where we of arcs for the characters of where we want them to go over a season, and then episode to episode we break it into smaller pieces so that it all starts fitting but I think the thing that guides us is always the emotional arc of where we know we're going okay uh, what do you find most surprising about the whole experience now that you've done three years of this how much fun it is <laughs> <laughs> does that tell us about your dark side huh no, you hear a lot about um, how hard, you know, different different shows are or, you know, Hollywood is. Or And I, I have to say this has been such a, a, a really lovely and fun, fun experience working with um, Carlton and Vera and Freddie and Olivia Max, Nestor, like all these incredibly talented people, you know, the, our production team, you know. It, it, it really is, you know, like, I can't believe sometimes I get paid to do this. Um, <laughs> you know, not to say it isn't hard, not to say that there aren't, you know, times when you want to, like, throw yourself off a cliff. Sure. <laughs> that, that's true in any job. But uh, it is it is an amazingly, um, it's kind of, it's a really special show. Um, and I, I, I would encourage people, if they have not looked at it yet, to pick up, an episode from the season, um, episode six, eight, or ten, 
uh, any any of them really, but just to kind of see what the show is, what what Vera is doing, what Friday is doing, um, what we're trying to do, and and I I I promise they will be pleased. I do um, too. I'm a, I'm that much of a fan of the uh, of the show. You're you're hemmed in by certain things. You you are tell retelling a classic story. There are certain things you can't do. Yes. Uh, but yet it's your job to imagine everything that you maybe can do and then yes. and then give us a great story. What's ended up on the cutting room floor during the process? Like like you said, oh, I would love it if Freddie would do this, or I'd love it, if it but we can't do that. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be true to the story or or the yeah. outlet where we're going. I mean, the scripts are so carefully written, we don't really end up with a lot on the cutting room floor, but where a lot of that comes out is in the writer's room, where we want to, we, we need, we feel things out a lot in there, like how far can we push this, uh, can, you know, especially some of the more um, kind of incestuous overtones between Norma and Norman, you know, how, how far can you push that and keep it real and um, without it just getting insane like you don't want people to disengage just because they're just nuts you know so you need to keep it very very real and very relatable and understandable as much as you can given that story but what um, did you want to do that you just felt you really couldn't do like in other words send norman loose on a killing spree through a neighboring town or something something that wouldn't be consistent with with did you ever what didn't we see that you really kind of wanted to do but said well we're not going to do that i honestly i don't I think there may have been things about Norman trying on her clothes that we left in the writer's room because it didn't ultimately feel like the right time. Um, and, it, you know, let's face it, like Freddie doing that is delicious. <laughs> really is. <laughs> that is going to be great fun. Um, and obviously you don't want it to get campy. You want to, you know, always keep it grounded. But that's another really fun thing about writing the show is that there are so, there's there's rules of what you can of lines you can't cross. There's rules of things you have to deliver because it's a mythology. There's rule and there's things you you can't totally cross certain lines um, without it getting fake. So it's kind of fun because it's like doing a puzzle. Right, right. <laughs> and the only way to do it is like you try stuff out in the room and you and then you you know I mean we like we like outline all these stories really carefully we talk through them a bunch of times, we act them out, certain scenes, you know, so it's, it's pretty fun. <laughs> wow, well that's wonderful. Well, all right, well, let's wrap up here. Thank you so much uh, for, for not just this, this conversation, but for a great show that's, that's uh, really worth uh, investigating and sticking to it. And, and it's so addictive besides, you've done a good job with all that. Thank good you luck so with the Emmys. Thanks, Carrie. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it.